to University of Jerusalem. Okay. Um, we bring lecturers from various fields related to Asia, China, Japan, Korea, India, Indonesia. And we are very proud to end the series for the spring term this year with a uh, Professor Sarah Sally Payne. Uh, professor Payne is the William S. Sims University Professor of History and Grand Strategy in the Strategy and Policy Department of the US Naval War College. Uh, she wrote several books, very important books on the First Sino-Japanese War and on the grand strategy of the Japanese Empire. And I read these books, I assigned these books in my courses, and I must say that very few scholars write so broadly and in bird's eye view on large long durée processes. And I think that's what makes a writing so distinguished. And uh, she wrote five books on naval history She's teaching in the Naval War College. And uh, today she will speak about comparative naval grand strategy of um, Japan, China, the US, uh, Britain, and uh, China. So uh, Professor Payne, please, floor is yours. Okay, thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm gonna to try to share my screen. Uh, are you called Jonathan? You know, okay, you share, you share the, you share the trend. I'm trying to share. Can you did? Can you, can you see? You, it? We see your screen. We see your screen. You got some nice war criminals there. Yes. Good. Now let me see. I right, wait a second. I do one other thing. Okay, I got too many faces. All right. It is a real pleasure to be here, and thank you so much for inviting you, me. But before I get going, I got to do a disclaimer because where I work. Uh, it's really obvious, but the views expressed here are mine. They're not necessarily those of the U.S. government, the Department of Defense, the U.S. Navy, or the Naval War College. So if you don't like what you hear, complain to me because they have nothing to do with it. Uh, anyhow, I'm starting here with how World War II Pacific ended. War crimes trials, Class A war criminals in the dock. And yet Japan was the model developing country in the 19th century. And in the 20th century, and now Japan sits among the group of seven of the, the richest industrialized democracy. So what on earth happened? Uh, back in the day when the uh, British were doing their little gumbo dunk diplomacy number in China, the United States did likewise to Japan when Commodore Matthew Perry, US Navy, started bombarding the Japanese coastline in these black ships. Well, when Lieutenant General Ishiwara Kanji was called up on the dock to testify as a witness, he was the rocket scientist who thought that invading Manchuria was a great idea in 1931. Here's what he told his American prosecutors. Tokugawa Japan believed in isolation and had its doors locked tightly. Then along came Perry, your guy, who started aiming his guns at us. And Japan for its own defense took your own country as its teacher and set about learning how to be aggressive why don't you subpoena Perry uh, from the other world and try him as a war criminal? In the 19th century, the Japanese looked on in horror as the Chinese were defeated twice in the Opium Wars and they figured we're gonna be next, correct? And they sent fact-finding missions to spend a long time in the West to figure out the nature origin of this threat and they concluded the problem was not only modernization, meaning you've got to get state-of-the-art equipment and military equipment, and that was China's conclusion, but the Japanese went a step further and said, you've got to do westernization as well. As much as you can't stand these people, you've got to westernize a whole series of civil and military institutions. And here's what they did as they looked around the world. Uh, they decided that Japan to protect its national security had to become an empire. Why? Because all the other great powers were basically empires. They saw no reason why Japan should be any different. Their empire by geography would have to be in Korea, moving into Manchuria, where uh, they were facing a power vacuum. Not only was the Qing dynasty losing every single war it fought with the West, but even more importantly, it was facing a succession of huge internal rebellions, civil wars, where literally tens of millions of people died. 
And the Japanese are going, the Russians are gonna fill this vacuum. Why? Because they're building the Trans-Siberian Railway to nowhere. The only thing that thing's gonna be good for is putting troops in places where we can't. So the Japanese decided before the Russians preempted their plans for empire, stage one is fix themselves, do these westernizing reforms and stay out of trouble while that's going on. But once that happens, then it's time to both get the empire and then protect it. So that's what they do. And their domestic reforms are impressive. You look at this one generation, they are westernizing their educational, judicial, military, financial, political institutions. It culminates with uh, the diet which they create and a constitution to run everything. And at this point, they go back to the British and say, renegotiate your treaties on the basis of juridical equality. Why? Because there is no reason to treat us any differently from any European power. And the British do it. The logic sound. China would not be able to rene renegotiate its unequal treaties for another half century until mid-World War uh, II. Uh, within 10 days of treaty revision, the Japanese launched the foreign policy phase of what they're up to. They want to get this empire, but they fire the opening shots of the first son of Japanese war that's going to get them Korea, and they want to contain Russia. These first two wars work, out, work very well for Japan. The third one, the second Sino-Japanese War, brings down the empire. Uh, what happened? Short answer, the Japanese got the geopolitics wrong. They are, were pursuing a continental foreign policy from an island location. Big mistake. This man, Vice Admiral Sato Tetsuturo, was one of the most famous important Japanese naval theorist. He was the pre president of their Naval War College. And his book, a published book of lectures, uh, made him really well read in his own country. He said, look, among the powers in the world, there are only three that can defend themselves primarily with navies. So the UK, the US, and Japan. This is a very profound observation. If you think, what if you look at the world, there are very few places that if troubles happen, they can defend themselves primarily by sea. Most people cannot. For instance, if you think about Ukraine today and their problem is Russia and occupation of Eastern Ukraine, buying a big Navy will not solve that problem. On the other hand, if you look at Britain's location where you have a very narrow uh, English channel, that kept Germans out of Britain for two world wars. So. This is a, a, one of the key characteristics that define, that distinguishes continental and maritime powers is whether you can defend yourself primarily by sea or whether it has to be by land. And depending what the answer is, you better invest in a big army or a big navy. Of course, it'd be nice to have both, but most people cannot afford both. Now I got a picture here with an awful lot of Americans in the water. And this is where you have sea power meeting land power on June 6, 1944, with uh, the D-Day invasions that made it, uh, the fact that most of, uh, uh, that we are all here has to do with these guys won. But the United States occupies a really curious position if you're thinking about this. Back in the day, the United States acted like a typical continental power. Uh, we invaded Canada twice in 1775 and 1812. The British won those things. And then when President Monroe is in office, he proclaims the Monroe Doctrine, which is a classic continental power spheres of influence, stay away from my neighborhood kind of doctrine. Of course, the United States couldn't enforce it. Never mind. It's a nice thought. Monroe uh, negotiates with the British and Spanish empires to straighten borders in the north and get Florida in the south. But unlike a typical continental power, the United States per, uh, preferred checkbook diplomacy to the massed army approach. So when Napoleon Bonaparte was short of cash, that's when the Louisiana purchase is made. When Alexander II of Russia is short of cash, that's, that's when the United States buys uh, Alaska. But when the checks were rejected, the United States did the continental thing, which is big armies, big fights. And that's what happened to the Mexicans in the Mexican-American War and the United States takes Texas from them. So the Mexicans accept the next check offered, which is the Gadsden Purchase, which gets the United States Southern Arizona. Meanwhile, the longest war in American history is going on. It's not the recent stuff in the Middle East. It's this one against the Native Americans who fought bitterly to retain their native lands. Uh, 
but they lose. And that ends about 18, 1890, it ends in a massacre at Wounded Knee. Um, the Americans have a name for this foreign policy. They named it back in the day. It was called Manifest Destiny, the idea that it was the manifest or obvious fate of the United States to basically dominate most of North America. And this lovely painting hangs today in the, I think it's a staircase as you're entering the chamber for the House of Representatives. It goes by its politically correct name, which is Westward Ho. Here's the name the painter gave it. Westward, the course of empire takes its way. Back in the 19th century, the Americans were an empire, proud of it. But a different view emerges at that time, propounded by this gentleman. He is by far the most famous person ever associated with where I work. He was back in the day when he was doing a lot of his writing, he was Cap Captain Alfred Thermahan. And he looked at the world and said, you know, today power and position is not a function of how much land you occupy. It's all about the money you can make from commerce. And he is emphasizing maritime power and what kind of a country you need to be to have a maritime foreign policy, which I'll get into. And he said there are th six prerequisites. You gotta have a moat, basically some kind of a security so that your immediate neighbor doesn't come in and just walk across the border and attack you. Secondly, you need a dense internal transport grid. You gotta get the goods out in peacetime. You need reliable egress by sea to get the Navy out in wartime. You gotta have a commerce driven economy. You gotta You've got to have a dense coastal population to be creating all the goods and getting them out to people. And then you need stable government institutions that are going to promote commerce and buy a big Navy. All right, if I take those prerequisites and I apply them to Russia and China today, I'm afraid not. Uh, Russia and China have more neighbors, the two of them, than any other countries on the planet. And sadly for them, most of those neighbors don't particularly like them. Uh, Russia's transportation grid is lamentable. Neither Russia nor China has reliable egress by sea. Just geography means that they are a far more easier to blockade than any of the, their likely adversaries are. Uh, uh, Russia has never had a commerce-driven economy, and China under Xi Jinping is busy privileging the public sector, and neither one of them has stable government institutions. The litmus test for that one is regular and transparent transitions of power and dictator for life does not remotely qualify. So, um, but there's a counter argument to Mahan and it's enunciated a generation later by a Briton, Sir Halford Mackinder. And this is his map from 1904. And he's writing in an age of railways when they're integrating the war. And he looks at what he calls the heartland, this pivot area, which corresponds to the Russian empire in his day, Russia in our day. And he looks at it and he goes, this is the citadel of land power on the great mainland of the world. It is the greatest natural fortress in the world, insulated as it is by mountains, deserts, frozen or narrow seas and rivers that are dead ending into area places that are really difficult to access by sea in wartime. And he said, this place is impervious to sea power. And if you look at it, this heartland is insulated not by the sea, but from the sea, from these formidable geographic barriers. However, it has an advantage for um, Russia in that Russia has the possibility for defense in depth, strategic retreat that it used in the Napoleonic Wars in World War II, and also self-sufficiency. But if the maritime world wants to get at this place, they can only do it from the shoreline. And McKinder said that this maritime power would be a function of bases. In his time, that would be colonies and strategic locations. In our time, that would be allies in strategic locations. This man, Nicholas Spikeman, was also terribly concerned by who controls the heartland. Uh, when he was writing his most famous work, it comes out basically the year he dies, his homeland of the Netherlands was under Nazi uh, occupation. And two years prior, he writes in 43, it seemed as if Hitler was on the cusp of taking the heartland. And here's what Spikeman said about two Americans, which was his adopted country. Despite occupying the safest position of any nation in the planet, we Americans are involved in two world wars in a quarter of a century. And the, in one, we were on the 
point of serious danger of defeat, i.e. the current one, the expectations of US statesmen were consistently wrong. They generally failed to provide answers, bad news. And he says, look at the world, the influence of the United States can be brought to bear on Europe and the Far East only by means of the sea. And that's the only way Eurasia can get to us, it's by sea. And this is, in true, this is true in spite of the growing import, importance of air power because the preponderant element of transport is still by sea as it is in our own day. So he tells Americans that US security is a function of sea power and that sanctuary at home is a function of this maritime sea. He coins the term rimlands and what he means is this, the edges of Eurasia. And he believes that the United States uh, ability to access the Rimlands is gonna be a function of having allies on the Rimlands. And ultimately that victory on, in World War II is gonna depend on alliances and alliance systems. That you can't launch military operations uh, from nowhere. You've gotta have a continental position to do it. All right, this has all been uh, a lead in. I have given you a whirlwind tour of some of the key geopolitical and naval theorists Sato, Spikeman, Mahan, McKinder. I'm gonna be using their terminology. And I've also given you a couple of hooks. One is about Japan and the Japanese making the wrong assessment of their geopolitical situation. And the other is the curious uh, position of the United States. And now I'm gonna reel it all in. I, what my plan is, is I'm gonna make an argument today about how the world is organized and how different types of powers follow different types of foreign policy. Back in the day, continental empires and maritime empires had very different approaches to how they were gonna organize themselves and how they would have liked to have organized others. And it led to lots of conflicts. And then I'm gonna end talking about uh, the maritime global order that, as, uh, that caused the, the retreat of continental and maritime empires. And it is a result of the industrial revolution and the institutional settlement of World War II. Um, and for those of you who like animals, because at Naval War College, we do like animals, we often refer to continental powers as elephants and maritime uh, powers as whales. Well, so that's your bonus vocabulary. But now to get right at it. Uh, McKinder's talking all about China, but uh, the real, because he's China was a country in fr uh, free fall in his day. But I, I mean, and he didn't care. And so he was always talking about Russia. I'm gonna start with China. And Sun Tzu, who is the great theorist of China, writes, provides advice to kings about how to stay on the throne, how to defeat their neighbors and how to absorb their neighbors cost efficiently. He does not mention naval warfare at all. And he only mentions riv riverine warfare tangentially. And this is for very good reasons. He's talking about this continental world in existence long before the maritime world. And it is all about fighting off your neighbors, dominating territories and killing people to get it. And if you think about it, a lot of the great civilizations of Eurasia are at their basis, great continental empires. And a civilization answers the questions, how should I live? And how should I interact with others? And many of different civilizations' answers are mutually exclusive and they account for a lot of fighting as people try to make their answers universal. China has faced barbarian um, invasions for a long, long time, uh, mainly from the North uh, until more recent times. Turns out uh, people have, been, have coveted Chinese manufacturers for a long, long time. China's probably the world's most successful empire uh, status it remains with the retention of Mongol, uh, a Mongol Muslim and Tibetan lands. I, I got a precipitation map because that's where it doesn't rain. And here's a temperature map and that's where it's pretty cold. And you'll get the point in a second. And this is a topographical map and that's where it's nice and flat. So if you put it together where you want to farm, it would be there. And, and here's an even better topographical map. It helps explain why China has uh, famine has been a, a constant problem over the course of Chinese history and why it's so reliant on food imports now. It's just way too much vertical land there. This is an ethnic map. See all the pink areas? That is where the Han, the preponderant 
uh, ethnic group live and you'll see surrounded them by them all these heterogeneous uh, ethnic groups. Here's a simplified ethnic map. And the curious might ask, how did the Han wind up with all the prime real estate, all the land you can actually farm? And the answer would be, uh, they laid waste to the competing Dzungar and Tibetan empires and to many, many other ethnic groups who over the millennia, if they knew what, good, what was good for them, they either became honorary Han or they fled because the answer to those who lose the game of continental empire is genocide. I bet you've, most of you have never heard of the Zungar empire. It's because that's what happened to them at the end. The Chinese just killed them all or, or most of them. And in our own day, apparently the Uyghurs are slated for genocide. All right, this is gonna be a sanitized view of Chinese history. The Han originated from the Yellow River Valley and they spread and they, or spread and they built walls and they contorted, built more walls, they spread some more. If I can only make this advance, they spread, they shrank, they spread, uh, contorted, consolidated, and a lot of consolidation before the conquest of others. This map is the Han version of the Yuan dynasty. The Yuan are not Han, they're Mongols. This is disguising the fact that uh, the Han were subjugated people. Here's the real map, the Mongols, uh, spread over the course of the 13th century from the east of Lake Baikal going in concentric rings over the Eurasian plain in a time of climate change when it was cold. And if you didn't move your herds, you would starve. But they didn't last long, but you should be aware of them. Largest dynasty and uh, empire in Chinese history goes all the way to Hungary. There's nothing else like it. It's number one in size. Uh, but the Han reasserted themselves in the Ming, but then the second conquest dynasty, these are the Qing, they're Manchus, they're not Han. This is the second largest dynasty uh, empire in Chinese history. And what's interesting when the Chinese today talk about their historic lands, they pick either, either the Mongol Yuan dynasty or the Manchu Qing dynasty when actually the Han were a subjugated people. Uh, never mind on that one. But my purpose for showing all these maps is to show you lots and lots of shrinkage, lots and lots of uh, expansion, and lots and lots of bloodshed in between. That's how these changes are taking place. China has been raising armies denominated in hundreds of thousands of people for thousands of years. Europe doesn't do it at least in, on a regular basis until the Napoleonic Wars. All right, so that's the story of China, what's the story in Russia, the country that Mackinder cared about so deeply? Because he's looking at lines of communication and going, railways are going to integrate this place. And if you look, um, Moscow, uh, Russia expands from Muscovy, and then it takes out the neighboring principalities. And there's a very lucrative fur trade that gets them all the way out to the Pacific coast. So they're like the Mongols in reverse. They're going east to west. But when Russians run into countervailing population centers, that's how far they got. This is a provincial map of the Russian Empire. It shows you all the provinces, they call gubernia, a governorates, and you got Moscow there, the historic capital. And the point here is that the, the provinces are pretty small near the historic capital. When you start getting out and about, they get large. Here's a little bit clearer map. And the recently ingested, and yet to be fully digested, get put in places not called gubernia, but oblasti. And they're in gray invisible type. So I did my best to give you a sense of where they're at. And it's, it's a way of, of when you take conquered people, you put them in oblast, and eventually if you can homogenize them, you'll make them into a regular province. In addition, Russia superimposed governor generalships and it's, it's a generalship, this is a military organization, and look where they are, they're over the conquered peoples, Finland, Poland, Ukraine, Caucasus, Turkestan, et cetera. And this is the way China also does it. You use pro changing provincial boundaries and you superimpose military regions and you change them as time, uh, as people get homogenized. And it is a way of, of integrating people into your empire and at least neutralizing them so they can't defect. Now, Mackinder talked about um, Russia in terms of the heartland, this interior lines of communication. 
but that comes with a corresponding disadvantage, which is multiple neighbors. These are Russia's no kidding security threats, circa 1900, there are lots of them. This is a very different security situation from say Britain with its 360 degree, you can't get me moat. Think about at it. Over the course of Russia's long and bloody history, loads of fighting with Germany, Austria-Hungary, the Ottoman Empire. Russia suffered catastrophic defeats to the Mongols, the Swedes, to Napoleon, uh, to the Germans in World War I and in, uh, initially in World War II and then initially uh, well, also in the Cold War. But the central opposition always allowed them to rise again. In this world, Power is a function of land. Neighbors are dangerous. That if you've got a little unstable neighbor, that's a problem because that instability can bleed over the border. But a stable neighbor can be worse if they have an agenda because they'll come get you. In this world, an army above all is for protecting the ruling regime. So when you think People's Liberation Army, it is the Praetorian Guard of the Chinese Communist Power. Party. Its number one job is keep communists on the throne. The second job of such armies is to garrison the empire. Don't allow any defections. Only thirdly is it at the extreme border offense, uh, defense. Whereas for maritime power, armies are always just about to do what are called away games of, of, of crossing a sea on some expedition and going after foreigners. Well, that's not this world. This world is all about fighting within your empire, on the edges of your empire, and then the winner takes the field. Now, there are some costs to fighting and even winning on the home front, uh, this home game. These are the deaths in World War II. Let's take a, take a look at access, just the military deaths. So you got 3.2 million dead Germans, one and a half million Japanese, one, a third of a million Italians. But now look, let's look at the deaths of the allied land powers, just military deaths. So it's eight and a half million Russians, a million Poles, 1.3 million Chinese, a third of a million Frenchmen. Oh, and by the way, France wasn't exactly in that war that long. Well, add in Britain and the United States, and by some statistics, you might disagree with these statistics, but by some statistics, Britain and the United States take fewer military uh, deaths than either Italy or uh, France. And if you add in civilian deaths, the numbers become even more skewed. They hardly budge from the maritime powers, but look what happens to Germany, 7 million dead, Russia, 25 and a half million, Poland, nearly 7 million, China, 11 million, France, nearly a million. Um, land power deaths are denominated in millions, not hundreds of thousands. Um, no one in their right mind wants to fight on the home front, main front, if there are alternatives. If you're a continental power and your problem sits across your border, you don't have choices. But a mar for a maritime port, uh, power, this is a, an incredible point of strategy. It's whether you get involved at all, and if you do, what's the timing going to be? For instance, in the Cold War, maybe the answer is you never have to engage on the main front. On the other hand, if you win there, there are certain advantages. For instance, the Russians paid a really high price, but Stalin at the end of the World War II, wherever the Red Army was, he kept those places. Uh, but he keeps them at a horrendous cost. The, co the, val the value of the object has gotta be wor worth it. All right, there are certain rules for playing to win in this sort of environment. Rule number one, no two front wars. Neighbors are multiple. You are crazy if you take more than one on at a time. Secondly, no great powers, uh, no great power neighbors, because today's friend, tomorrow's foe, and that spells problems. So what do you do? You take on your neighbor sequentially, you set them up to fail, you destabilize the rising, you ingest the failing, you set up buffer zones in between, and you wait the opportune moment to pounce and absorb. This is Vladimir Putin's game. And even better, you get the neighbors to do the work for you. You sow their mutual uh, resentments. You deluge them with fake news. And so when they squabble with each other, you play the role of a jackal state that you come on in and take the kill made by others. Now, there's a problem with this in the modern era because what you're doing is surrounding yourself with failing states. And there are no enduring alliances in this world because the neighbors get it that the hegemonic power uh, just means trouble in the long run. Also, this theory of security offers no counsel on when to stop. 
And there's a tendency for overextension, which may well explain the catastrophic implosions that have periodically occurred over the long and bloody histories of Russia and China. But before you dismiss all of this, understand it was highly effective prior to the Industrial Revolution. This is how the great civilizations did it. They had no problems getting rid of insurgencies. They just kill them all and kill extras. They don't care about collateral damage in this world. It's all about uh, taking land, killing people to get it. And you've seen it operating in real time, right? Uh, 2016, Aleppo, 2017, Mosul, 2019, Idlib, or if I'm off by a year, I apologize. Uh, but this sort of fighting explains why the ancient ruins are ruins. And here is uh, Vasily Kluchevsky, he's one of the finest historians of the late Tsarist period describing his country. He said, the history of Russia is a history of a country in the process of colonizing uh, itself. We ebb and flow and it's, uh, we, we keep trying to ingest all this, this land. So here he's talking about the continental world that if you have little places that are unstable, you got to take them. Otherwise, someone else will, or worse yet, they'll become a security threat in their own right. A generation later, here you have Russia's great novel, a novelist, Fyodor Dostoevsky, the author of Crime and Punishment and Other Light Reads, uh, writing in his diary. Uh, in Europe, we were hangers on and slaves, whereas in a uh, we shall go to Asia as masters. In Europe, we were Asiatics, whereas in Asia, we too are Europeans. Our civilizing mission in Asia will bribe our spirit and drive us Thither, this expansionism, et cetera, is just a feature of Russian uh, history. And here you have probably the greatest statesman of the late Tsarist peri uh, period, Finance Minister Sergei Vita, looking around the world uh, in his day and saying, look, the problem is to obtain as large a share as possible of the outlived Oriental states. And he's thinking of the Ottoman Empire and also especially of the Chinese Empire. And he said, look where we're located. We, by rights, should get most of this stuff. The absorption by a considerable uh, portion of the Chinese empire is only a matter of time unless the Chinese get their act together. So here is a man who is at the highest echelons of Russian leadership, thinking in terms of Russian foreign policy being territorial expansion. Well, this is what Putin apparently thinks as well. And there's a problem for the likes of Putin, that if a continental power botches grand strategy, its entire world can vanish forever. And this is the fate of Imperial China, Imperial Russia, and many great civilizations of uh, Eurasia. I love this picture of uh, aristocrats' whimsical palace. And it's a world that's utterly dead as, one of, as a result of one of the great genocides of the 20th century when the communists made good their promise to kill off entire social classes, which they did in the, uh, the Russian Revolution, Civil War, collectivization, and then great purge trials that finished the job. This is a world without insurance policies. Now for the maritime world. I love this map of um, showing, who knows how accurate it is, but it gives you the, the point is that in the 19th century, the Atlantic was a busy, busy place. It was the center of the world's economy. These are the wealth producing rimlands that's, uh, that uh, uh, Mackinder and others and Spikeman are talking about. And it's a different world. It begins in the West anyway, I think with the ancient Greeks, but someone can correct me, but you have the Athenian empire. It's one of these rimland empires all about making money from trade. It's very different from the consolidated empires of Russia and China. Here's the Roman empire, same idea, rimlands. And think about Mediterranean, the der derivation of the word meta, middle, Terranean land. So it's the sea in the middle of the lands. Think about China, Zhong Guo, Zhong center, Guo, kingdom. It's the kingdom centered among the kingdom. One piece of terminology emphasizes the centrality of the seas, the other, the centrality of the land. Byzantine empire, another Rimland empire. And then no, for a long time, no one controls the complete Rimland anymore. And part of the issue and the fight for the Rimlin is about who is going to dominate the really lucrative East-West trade. It's been lucrative for a very long time. And I, this, where I've got circled there in um, yellow 
is basically if you control the, the business end of this trade route, you can make a lot of money. That's where the route to go north to Europe or south or different uh, et cetera, enormous fighting over who's going to control that. For a while, it's the Arab conquest seems to answer that question. Then they build all sorts of beautiful buildings. Meanwhile, there is a continental consolidation going on in Europe. Um, modern Germany and modern France date themselves to the conquest of Charlemagne at the turn of the eighth to the ninth centuries. This is when the Germans call it the First Reich and other people call it the Holy Roman Empire. So if you get to Europe around a thousand, you see a lot of large consolidated continental states. No one's controlling the Rimlands. And this is when you're gonna get the, the Crusades. This is a fight for the Rimlands. And the Turks eventually win that, the Ottomans, the Ottoman Empire. And they're controlling the, uh, the toll booth there, making money off the East-West trade. And so the Europeans have to get a little more creative. And this is when you get the Spanish and the Portuguese trying to get to Asia the long way around. And uh, except they bump into the new world, which has actually been there forever, but it's new to them. And also gold and silver is also new to them and they have the idea of spices and they're into heavy metal. So it's the Dutch who are the real um, innovators of, uh, or their empire is very much defined by their trading bases. They're not after big swaths of territory, even though Indonesia is really big, but it's all about their, tra their trade. It's commerce is what they're after. And what they're really interested in is making sure no one interferes with their commerce. Sea powers such as the Dutch Republic tend to support uh, the development of international law so that we can all share the oceanic commerce, uh, the oceanic commerce, oceanic commons and trade in um, safety. And so here you have the founding father of international law, Hugo Grotius of the Dutch Republic. And he writes in Mare Liberum, free, uh, The Free Seas, every nation is free to travel every other nation, uh, to every other nation and to trade with it. Uh, you're gonna get there by sea. And in his Law of War and Peace, he is citing a Roman jurist saying to all men belong the use of the sea. And then he cites a Byzantine recodification of, Europe, of Roman law. By natural law, the following are common to everyone, the air, flowing water, the sea, and in consequence, the seashore. So this idea of, of maritime commons, it goes back a long, long time in Western thinking. Uh, but that doesn't mean other people think this way. For instance, in 1996, China signed, it ratified the UN law, a uh, convention on the law, law of the sea, UNCLOS. And by the rules of UNCLOS, everyone gets freedom of navigation within 12 nautical miles of everybody else. Well, China says, uh, no, 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 it's 200 nautical miles, even though it signed a treaty that says 12. Well, in the East and South China Sea, these numbers matter. But the real um, innovators on maritime uh, empire are the British, because for the Dutch, their continental position is exposed and they wind up being defeated in Europe. And that's a problem for them with their empire. But the British had this wonderful island location. So while their neighbors all have to maintain large standing armies, Britain alone doesn't have to do that. And it has relative prosperity. So it can focus on making money from trade. It's got to have a big Navy and the, that big Navy is going to ensure that it drowns invading armies at sea. It's gonna use its naval uh, dominance to make sure no one gets to Britain. But if everybody in Europe is busy destroying wealth at a clip, trying to kill each other, and Britain is off making money with these colonies and other things, time joins Britain's side. It, can't, it gets richer and richer while other people aren't. It can't solve the continental problems, but um, at least it's got it, homeland security covered in this uh, uh, paradigm. And the British did a lot of thinking. They had a whole generation to do it of dealing with Napoleon Bonaparte. And it's, there were six failed coalitions dealing with revolutionary France and, and uh, Bonaparte, and finally the Capstone Alliance when Napoleon's enemies finally figure out how to put things together to get rid of him. And the British are instrumental in this. Navies aren't usually decisive in warfare. They, they, they can't usually solve all of your problems. And the British learned through much of trial and error how to integrate multiple instruments of national power in order to, to win their wars. And they indeed coined the term grand strategy, they invent it. So here's their problem. This is the world before the catastrophes. You have these 
consolidated states east and west and a big tidbit zone in between the Holy Roman Empire. Well, Napoleon, well, revolutionary France and then Napoleon are gonna take the tidbit zone. Fast forward to 1812, this is Napoleon's maximum territorial ex extent. Scary year for Britain. This is when Clausewitz, the guru of land warfare is getting some of his best ideas. But this is when the Britain, Britons are thinking, well, how do, what, how do we deal with this? And here is their an answer to elephant hunting of what do you, how do you deal with continental powers? And here's the game they played. Rule number one, keep the home economy growing. Whatever you do, protect trade, because that's where your money comes from. That's going to pay for everything. Rule number two, don't let the elephant forage. You've got to close down your enemy's trade and you blockade them. So they are just stuck. And then rule number three is you rent an elephant. You go find the continental power most threatened by your enemy and you arm, you fund, you do everything you can think of for that beleaguered power fighting on the main front. Rule number five, uh, rule number four, you figure out a peripheral theater that is more accessible to sea power than land power that you know your continental adversary is gonna fight to hold. And the reason you do that, it's not only you're gonna force them to fight on divided attentions in multiple theaters. You are also going to have an attrition rate that favors you versus the person you hate. They're going to lose more than you are. And thirdly, the cumulative attrition of whatever you're doing in the, the peripheral theater, whatever your, your ally's doing on the main theater, over time, you're going to win this thing. Now, the, rule number five is a rule the British broke at great cost in World War I, is whatever you do, don't take on the main army of your enemy directly. You certainly don't do that as an opening move. That's your, their strength, not yours. Maritime powers, it's navy, it's uh, alliances, it's, it's uh, trade, it's ability to create wealth, it's ability to wait things out. Rule number six, you fight on the main front only very late in the game when you've really bled the elephant and you come in with lots of friends. As much as a continental power would, might want to play this game, they can't because you need command of the sea to do it. You got to dominate the seas and a continental power un is unlikely to have that sort of position. But if Britain did this, it put in motion a virtuous circle of pernicious effects of setting itself and its enemies on opposing trend lines. The war increasingly encroached on enemy territory, undermined enemy economy, productive capacity, standard of living, undercutting enemy morale, which together is going to de destroy the enemy's ability to wage war. Basically, you're going to win by exhausting the enemy first. But no, this uh, theory of security is based probably largely on non-military instruments of national power. It's all about economics, coalitions, and institution building. And it has certain prerequisites. You've got to have sanctuary at home. You've got to you have a protected, productive base. You need access. You have to have access to markets, access to peripheral theaters, access to allies to help them out. And you need institutional stability at home to maintain a long-term foreign policy. These are some of the prerequisites that Mahan would later emphasize. Well, what well, after Napoleon was offed, um, and Europeans more or less went along with a maritime trading regime, you get the long 19th century, very profitable, incredible wealth creation, doesn't last forever. But this is now uh, brings me to my second characteristic that distinguishes maritime from continental powers. The first one is whether you can or cannot defend yourself by sea. Um, this one has to do with having multiple neighbors and if you have multiple neighbors, you're going to be preoccupied with them versus if you have relative security, you might want to focus on other things. So continental powers are all worried because their neighbors can deploy immediately on exclusive zones and maximizing their conquests and insulating themselves from their neighbors for very good reasons. Whereas maritime powers who have relative security are all about maritime commons where we can all maximize money together and we can all have access to global markets. In, if depending upon which category you sit in, you prefer two totally different world orders. One wants to close off the near seas. You can see China doing that today. The other one about free navigation. So this is the second distinguishing uh, characteristic, whether you're gonna focus on insulation from landward problems or access to overseas markets and what sort of world order you're gonna want out of that. Okay, this brings me to the game changer that's gonna cause problems for both continental and um, maritime empires and ultimately lead into 
the maritime rules-based global order that's developing in our own day. So while Napoleon was in action, there was an industrial revolution that was occurring in Britain. So it doesn't get to the continent until the war has settled down and it's been gradually making its way around the world ever since. It's based on technological and institutional stage uh, changes. In its early stages, it was based on steam power, iron industry, textiles, insurance, and banking, later stages, railways, telegraphs, steamships, mass markets, armaments, general staffs, those sorts of things. And it upends the world because it produces compounded economic growth. That previously, the currency of international power and wealth had been a function of land, right? Land produced the, the commodities that you could sell, and it's from uh, rural areas that you're going to get your peasant uh, conscripts to field mass armies. Well, once you get the Industrial Revolution, the money is to be made from commerce, trade, industry. It's a very different world. And it is horrific for traditional societies. If you look at the world today and who's rich, who's not, who's powerful, who's not, it has to do with who's more industrialized and who's not. And the compounding effects uh, between those who get on with the program and industrialize and those who don't become unbelievable. That countries that had perfectly good security paradigms, suddenly they don't work anymore. An incredibly traumatic event uh, that countries across the world still haven't gotten over. For instance, ISIS or whatever is left, uh, is left with it uh, utterly reviles this sort of world. Yeah, maybe they want to use some of the technology, but and institutional basis and the liberal political institutions. 19th century China also was appalled by this incoming maritime event that was happening to them. And today it remains profoundly ambivalent about international law and institutions. Here's another piece of the Industrial Revolution, which is the Suez Canal. And this just wrecks the, um, the Silk Road that it's, gonna, it, it's just so much cheaper to bring in goods by sea than it is on these inland areas. And it just changes how money's to be made. Money's not to be made by uh, uh, leading camels through Afghanistan. And I'm gonna fast forward a hundred uh, years to things near you. In the Six Day War, uh, my understanding is Egypt didn't want Israel using the Suez Canal. So they put in block ships, that's in 67. Well, they don't, clear out the block ships, I believe, until 1975. That's a long time to close the Suez Canal. So they, the Egyptians do it for military reasons, but let's look at the strategic effects. Prior to this war, 90% uh, of, the, of the world's ships are these small things, less than 50,000 deadweight tons. Well, and after, while the, the, the um, now it's closed, the shipping companies get wise and they start building these big, much bigger ships than it ever built before. So then you fast forward to after the, the war is over and a third of the, the shipping's in these big ships. And then it gets even more exciting. If you look at the cost of taking oil from the Persian Gulf to Rotterdam in 1972, if you take one of these little ships, it costs uh, over $13 per ton. Well, I'll take one of the big ones, go the long way around, and it's less than $5. Shipping companies get it. It's not about distance, it's about ship overhead. So the Egyptians marginalized themselves economically doing that one. Never mind. Um, another person who uh, really consequential for this global transition is this man, Malcolm McLean. He ran a trucking company and he had the idea he was gonna load these trucks minus the chassis, what we call containers, both on decks and below decks on ships. And when he does this, he reduces loading costs from nearly $6 a ton to less than 20 cents. And very shortly thereafter, these container sizes are standardized globally to go one if by truck, two if by rail car, and thousands if by sea. And the cost of transport have just plummeted over the course of this 20th century, and they're still going down. When companies that get their parts from overseas, calculate the costs in their equations for uh, of how much things to figure out the calculate the value of the thing, they enter the number zero for shipping costs because they're inconsequential relative to the value of the items being shipped. Uh, the latest dictator for life, Xi Jinping, is all excited about his Belt Road initiative. Good luck with that one. 
uh, here's, here's the data. Prior to 1960, average tanker sizes were 20,000 deadweight tons. Today, the smallest ultra-large crude tankers are a quarter of a million deadweight tons. If you want to use a belt road thing, I guess you'd have to be shipping down pillows or something, but the largest train you're going to get through is going to have about 600 containers. And even if I'm off slightly, there's no way it's going to come close to the largest container ship, which is over 21,000 containers. And there's another issue to use that belt road thing. You've got to control the rail line from end to end, which is a tall order since it goes through some of the most unstable places on the planet. For shipping, if there's an unstable region of the globe, you just bypass it. Moreover, the areas, the shipping lanes that China wants to use are only going to be available to it in peacetime. As long as we're all at peace, everyone gets to use everything. Uh, but in wartime, China doesn't have the Navy or the geographical position. Uh, there are just too many cho choke points to, uh, you, it would need a massive alliance system and having allies like North Korea and Pakistan is not going to get them there. Uh, this transportation revolution has been a miracle for the world. It has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. And you look at it, it just takes off after the end of the Cold War. That's when the line starts going vertical. It's called goodbye and good riddance, Soviet Union. And the problem for Mr. Putin is that this growth is taking place in countries that are vested in the rules-based maritime order, not in countries that are vested in extortion. So this brings me to the third characteristic distinguishing uh, maritime and continental powers that in the, the old days, interior lines of communication were great because you're in the central position, you can get your armies anywhere, you're, and uh, you're going to eat away at any of the problems, etc. You're good to go. Well, since all the money is now to be made on exterior lines of communications, that's a little problem. Uh, for continental power. So this, this reliance on interior versus exterior lines of communications, ocean, oceanic tra trade by definition is an exterior line, and it leads to preferences or possibilities for different sorts of alliance systems. If you're contiguous, you're allies, so you're China, who am I going to pick? North Korea and Pakistan. Okay, have fun with it. Whereas uh, with a global if, if you're on exterior lines, the world is your oyster on this miniature alliance. So the Industrial Revolution put continental and maritime, uh, put continental empires on notice, uh, not only because these landlines are just being overtaken by events, and this is the tragedy of the those occupying the real estate between, well, basically inland, Syria, or all the way to Afghanistan, who've been marginalized by all this, but because the Industrial Revolution opened a possibility for a positive sum world order. Let me explain this. The continental world of warring spheres of influence and um, subverting your neighbors is negative sum. Why? Because if you're fighting about territory, the goods get damaged in the fighting. So whatever the loser's loss is, you're getting damaged goods. So the winner's win is a negative sum. And um, you're destroying wealth at quite a rapid clip. So the, the, the uh, maritime world is all about positive sum transactions. That once you get the industrial revolution in and more people on board with international law, then you can do trade where the last thing you want to do is ruin your customer. Your customer will never come back. And it's got to be a win-win or there's no such thing as a customer. And in this world, it's not focusing on territorial confiscation. Who wants to be running other people's business? What a headache. Most of us can barely uh, handle our own countries, let alone anybody else. And this world is based on freedom of navigation, free trade, international laws and institutions, facilitating trade in order to minimize transaction costs. And what's interesting about it is countries that are not maritime by geography can gain a maritime position by virtue of their friends who all gang up, whether it's legally or militarily or what they do, on countries that go rogue, often by sanction saying, if you don't play nice, you get an international time out. So um, the insurance system of this maritime world order is alliances and institutions. 
the World War I generation were incredible. Here they, as young people, they fought World War I and then they came home to start their families in a great depression. And then they were, became the strategic leaders of World War II. And they built a really good series of international institutions to hold the peace. Uh, President Truman in the United States was able to do it despite um, a really vicious partisan atmosphere with Joseph McCarthy doing his witch hunt against communists. Too bad he couldn't figure out who the communists were, but that's a different problem. But uh, while Truman was president, he supported the creation of the UN, the IMF, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the pre pre predecessor institutions of the World Trade, to, uh, World Trade Organization and the EU, the NATO, uh, the um, Organization for American States, and at, at home in the United States, he created a really robust national security architecture that is successor Republican um, Eisenhower doubled down on because this is their generation to uh, answer to holding the peace, something that World War II generation so uh, of the leader, the people who are leading World War II had so conspicuously failed to do. If you look at all the wars of the Cold War, not all of them, but many of them were fought on this inner marginal crescent that the peace was held for mostly the industrialized countries, not all of them, uh, and much of the fighting is then elsewhere. All right. But this maritime world is invisible. It took me 15 years at the War College to, to see, uh, it has to do with negative objectives why it's invisible, I'll get there, that the Connell world is all about positive objectives. Positive objectives are making things happen. So I'm gonna take territory, I take territory, you see I did it. A negative objective is about preventing something from happening. So if you prevent something from happening, who knows any, whether anything was even happening, right? Oh, you're taking credit for something no one even tried to do. So this Connell world is all about positive operational objectives of beating people up and destroying wealth at a rapid clip. But it yields a really awful strategic objective of poverty. You're just wrecking people. It's a bad outcome. The maritime world is actually, a lot of it, it's about negative objective of preventing people from wrecking things. And if you prevent them from wrecking things, the things are there and it looks like you did and nothing. And this is the US Navy's heartburn is the US Navy has three really important um, negative objectives. One of them is preventing the destruction of the global trading system. That would be a high value item. There's no maritime order if we can't trade with each other. The second one is preventing people messing with uh, freedom of navigation. Uh, that's really important. And the third one is either deterring or uh, what, trying to prevent territorial expansion. And you think about it, sovereignty is the bedrock principle of international law. Well, how do maritime powers do this? They ally with each other. They join these international institutions. They engage in diplomacy to figure it out. And they quite often sanction, embargo, and contain the problem children. Well, and we all know about compounded growth. It's great, right? Um, but there's also the compounded growth that fails to happen. This is the invisible stuff, is that if you just shave off a percentage or two of growth on a particular country because you sanction them, they still get goods in, but it's more expensive. That has fabulous compounding effects. Just take a look at the difference between North and South Korea today and you can kind of get the, the idea. So uh, the Navy is all about uh, deterring all these things, et cetera, so that you have this operate, negative operational goal of preventing things, but it yields a positive strategic effect, which is compounding um, prosperity for the cooperative and poverty for the rogues. And the rogues survive to cause problems another day, but the gap in wealth gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So they're corralled at acceptable costs. And oh, by the way, if the rogue has nuclear weapons, really it's better to corral them rather than have them lob one of those somewhere. Uh, the, this maritime world is about strategic wins. It's not the operational feel good, I beat them up, yay me. It's about let's maximize wealth for all of us. Now, the optimists at the end of the Cold War thought that it was going to be liberal democracy for all of us. Not so. This maritime continental disagreement continues to the present. And I have pictures here of two exemplars of these rogue states. Um, they would be Mr. Fit and Miss Fit, uh, Putin and Kim in their native habitat. And they wanna get rid of inter international laws. They wanna bust our alliances. 
they want to break up this maritime thing and return us to warring wealth reducing spheres of influence. And uh, the great question is where this gentleman is sits. But to sum up, um, there are geographic differences. You're, you're, you're dealt a hand of cards in life. And the discriminators between maritime and continental powers are the inability versus the ability to defend primarily at sea. Secondly, a desire, a focus on insulation from versus access to the world. And thirdly, a reliance on interior versus exterior lines of communication. Um, now, uh, if, if, if this is the geographic hand you've been dealt and you have to worry about immediate neighbors causing you problems, it leads to different preferences, right? Continental powers focusing on territories to take versus maritime powers about markets to make money. A focus for the continental folks on economic self-sufficiency because you gotta be careful. You may not be able to get out to your markets whereas maritime powers want access to markets. Focus on exclusive zones. Now you might observe, well, most cat countries don't fit neatly into this continental maritime oversimplification that I've just bored you with for the last hour. Uh, there's a corollary to this, which is alliances can bestow a collective maritime position and power package as all of us talk to each other and uh, coordinate not only our soldiers and sailors, but our diplomats, our financiers, our computer technicians, et cetera. And this creates this incredible power package uh, to the whole that would be denied to the, the parts. And the great question is what China is going to do at the end of the day. And they're in the, they're in the position now making some very portentous choices like Japan did back in the day. And the Japanese didn't get their geopolitical position right. It's unclear whether China gets it either. And uh, one hopes that the Chinese Communist Party doesn't end its day this way, because somehow comes up with an answer that's a little better than this one. But if genocide is the answer on how China is going to deal with neighbors, then well, who knows where we're at. So anyway, that is what I got to say to you all. And now I'm gonna try and figure out how to stop sharing my scene, screen. Okay, I think I should be back. You're back. Yeah, I'm back. Thank you, Sally, for this really great talk. It was interesting and enlightening and kind of a tour de force Verde's view. As the commentator, I'll focus on two things which may complement your theory from, I'm a historian, I'm an archival historian who kind of more works from the ground up. And I wonder about two things. First of all, you divide in your books as well, uh, countries who take the maritime grand strategy and uh, countries who take the land grand strategy, at least in the case of Japan, I wonder whether if you really look kind of with a big focus, whether a country is actually choosing a strategy. Because if I'm looking at Japan, let's say at the turn of the century, in the Taisho period, I see a lot of squabbles between the army and the navy. And I don't see this moment of choice. For example, I, I at least personally, interpret the Second World War not as choosing the army, strat army strategies over the navies, but actually because of the political weakness of the political establishment in Japan, they choose to implement both strategies at once. And that's why they implode. Uh, the second thing I, I would like to say is that some countries, you can say, choose a mixed strategy. I'm thinking about Turkey. Um, Erdogan's Turkey has a lot of characteristic which you define according to your criteria as a typical behavior of a land empire. And Turkey, of course, controls a very important mass of land, but it's also a very, it's also a very important maritime power and uh, much of its struggles is over dominance on sea lanes and natural resources in the sea. 
so uh, the strategies can be mixed. Um, this is not to contradict your theory, but just to give a different uh, perspective or a complement. Um, I think that's uh, my comments. Maybe uh, we'll uh, open it up to questions from the audience and then you may kind of gradually answer uh, in my queries as well, because I think people have many questions and I'm not sure. What do you think you want to answer now or uh, we'll open no, it? I'm fine, you've, you've made a great point. And uh, Electra, I have uh, done such gross injustice so, to so many topics this morning, uh, it's unbelievable. But I think what frameworks by definition are oversimplifications, but I think they're helpful. And you're quite right, there isn't this moment when the Japanese go, okay, I got choice A, choice B, which, what's it gonna be? And um, the reason I give you the maritime framework is this is me inventing it. Uh, when I give you those rules, this is me. I've done all of these case studies for years about wars at the Naval War College. I start my career as an expert, well, trying to be an expert on Russia and China. And then they hire me to do my week suit at the War College. And then I wind up learning about Russia, uh, excuse me, the United States and Britain. And it, what it strikes me is negative objectives. That's the part that's really hard to see. So I, I, I give you negative objectives because it's, it's the hardest thing to see because the positive things you see, it's also as a historian, I get the bad choices they made, but what are the choices they didn't make that they should have made? I and mean, that helps you evaluate stuff. And it's just, it's hard. So I, I agree with you, but there's, there are other pieces on Japan uh, there are other elements to look at things. You need to look at primary adversaries. The Japanese never, it's like, fellas, who are you always fighting? It's the Chinese. And yet they're always focused on everybody else, except you're fighting the Chinese. So why don't you focus on your war colleges on China? Because that would be the problem for you. And there are other uh, issues about whether you like my entire framework or not, that never mind. But there's another piece about if you have an island location like Japan, if you cannot produce enough food and you cannot produce the energy of your day. So think about Britain, it produces coal in the industrial revolution and it can do all sorts of things. And this is one of the reasons Britain's really toast in World War II, it cannot produce the, uh, the oil it needs. And that's a, just a massive vulnerability. So if you wanna do this kind of, I'm gonna really clobber some big neighbors, you gotta have food, you've got to have energy. And then there are other things as well. So when Japan is doing its empire, they're not paying attention to that feature. In fact, they shoot their finance, well, actually they um, carve up into little pieces, uh, their finance minister who's telling them, uh, you can't do this. It, their problem has to do with eliminating their civil leaders. You've got to talk to each other. So I'm with you, there isn't uh, one big moment there. I've given you an oversimplification. What, what the, uh, the Meiji leaders has followed a much more maritime event, although they have continental ambitions, they want to get this big empire, but they're op operating at the cusp of two worlds. There's the outgoing continental order and there's the incoming maritime one, and they're looking towards the outgoing order. And uh, let's think about our, our own day. Are you going to tell me what the world's going to look like in a hundred years and do it safely and figure it out? It's hard to know. In, in one's own times. But I think the, um, the big lesson uh, for Japan and for all of us, and I think the World War II generation learn it, is watch the world economy. Don't let something like the Great Depression happen. It makes desperate people go on the march all over the world. Don't do that. You have to figure out something else. So that would be the answer one. Yeah, sure, Turkey's got a mixed strategy. France has had to have a mixed strategy. It has Germany and it's got an ocean and it's got Britain and Turkey's got problems. When Turkey fears Russia, then it's all about, hey, NATO, love you guys. <laughs> and when Russia's down for the count, it's like, no, I didn't actually like you guys very much at all anyway. So it goes back and forth. But I, to me, it's the possibility that if we work together on these institutions where we all squabble endlessly, but at least then we're not shooting guns at each other, that this is the way to solve. The moment you start destroying wealth with the, the continental event. It's, it's expensive, kill a lot of people, make them bitter for generations. So 
Anyway, that's my take. Your points are excellent. Thanks, Ali. So I think we'll open it to the floor. Um, anybody has questions, comments? Oh my, I, I killed off the conversation. Everyone's in deep shock. Well, if, I, if I can make a, a point, um, you, you're talking about the, the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh -huh. And uh, of course, I think the, the Chinese are very aware of the, uh, the maritime importance and consequently they are taking over ports like in Gwadar, uh, in Pakistan, building ports in Malaysia to counter the choke point in, in Singapore and uh, entering Europe with uh, Piraeus and, uh, and a multiple of other ports that they're moving into. Um, and so I think they're very aware of the, the importance of, uh, of the maritime plus building up their navy and not to talk about the South China Sea issue. So um, I, I think they're there on that point. And uh, one of the fears is the, the strength of their navy. Uh, the problem for China is there, in peacetime, it's great for them. And the problem with their basing, some of it is based on having treaty ports. And as I last remember, the Chinese really hated treaty ports. They thought that was outrageous that the West did to them. So now they got a 99 year lease in Sri Lanka and whatever else they're doing, these are treaty ports. And um, they've got a Ponzi scheme. Basically they have way too much um, capacity to build for construction because it's been necessary in China until recently. So now the solution to that is to build everything for everybody else. But to make that viable, you got to charge a lot of money. But the reason that infrastructure wasn't built in those places is often because there isn't much money to be made. So now currently it looks okay, except with COVID, I don't think it's going to be remotely okay because everyone has taken such a massive hit. And Israel, like the States, is a rich country, but most countries aren't like that. The hit from COVID has got to be awful. And uh, I, I just don't think they're going to make the money off of it. And then when they start demanding the terms, oh, yeah, China's told people, oh, we don't renegotiate our debts. Well, great. Um, I remember back, I'm old enough to remember uh, when the Latin Americans got sick of the United States with uh, a variety of infrastructure and other things that we wanted to keep mo making money on at the same rates. And they said, no, you're not. It's nationalized. Good luck with it. Try occupying all of South America and see how that goes for you. So, and the problem with ports is the reason, for instance, if you look at World War II, the United States could use ports all over the world is because if you take Japan, it didn't have a single friend on the planet. Uh, even the people in the occupied countries were all for the United States. So the only person that's going after American traffic are Germans, which were a real problem, and, um, and the Japanese. Well, China doesn't have that many friends. If it really got ugly, uh, I don't see them getting to Djibouti. So in peacetime, great. I have a grand time at the Piraeus. And peacetime is what we all want. But if you think it's going to play in wartime, unless you're much nicer to people, and this is where their territorial claims are, uh, are ludicrous. It's uh, an, an enemy maker. Uh, look at the map and the, the stuff that they're claiming is way, the enemy said for years we have no territorial claims because you'd have to be unbelievable. I don't know, it'd be like Israel telling the Spanish that you own part of their coastline. <laughs> and this is, is, this is um, China's problem. They're creating a countervailing alliance. And then all the cyber stuff of downloading a lot of people's government, etc. That's just designed to create an opposing alliance. People don't like that treatment. So, over. Uh, Yahli? Yeah, uh, thanks for the presentation. I, I wonder, you've described the uh, um, industrial revolution as a huge change, and I wonder whether the techn technological revolution that we're now facing changes your uh, analysis, right? Because at least in the areas that I'm dealing with, the entire discussion moves towards uh, artificial intelligence, cyber power, and all of the relevant uh, countries are part of this discussion. Those are great points. And uh, it'll be your generation and your children's generation who make these decisions. I won't live long enough to see how it evolves. But I when I look at the Industrial Revolution, it 
triggers economic growth and what you're talking and, and really rapid changes that prior to the industrial revolution, basically the way you lived and way your great, 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 whatever it is lived is more or less the same. And when I think of the changes, well, my father's life, there were horses uh, and they eventually the family got a car and my generation i had a typewriter right and now i'm i got this computer and now we're zooming and i'm talking to israel in real time it's just what you're talking about is this it's just faster and faster and faster and i don't know the answer to climate change oh i wonder i keep thinking when we get these battery cars it's going to make a big uh when the batteries get good it's going to be such a huge change and you're right about all the artificial intelligence and cyber, it's just these enormous, enormous changes. And for me, I would lump it into all of that together. And, but you might well say, no, you need to disaggregate it. Um, and, uh, but you're, you're absolutely on, we're, we're into massive changes, but for all the problems, and there are many of them, uh, the number of people who have been lifted out of poverty is incredible. Um, the number of famines that go on in the world now, it used to be endemic. It's now rare. One of the reasons the climate is a mess is there are too many of us, right? There are billions and billions of us, right? Well, people aren't having so many children and that may well change just by uh, not having that many kids. So um, that would be my answer to your excellent question. So I see a question in the chat here by a Dogilad. New approaches of the North Sea Russian Canal or the Eurasian Rail and Maritime Roads Belt and Road Initiative in construction do not raise new global future in your view? Wait you can second. see the question in the oh, chat. Oh, yeah, I'm looking at it. Yeah, um, the North Sea. Um, the problem with the North, it's... Um, the, all the Arctic things. Uh, yeah, you can have a quicker shipping route up there. The problem, my understanding from the Navy folks is part of it, the only part of it that's really deep, you have to go pretty close to Russia to get through parts of it. And also the way the ice is now and who knows how it changes, but you have to go too close to Russia, which means the Russians then want to limit what goes on there. And I'll go back to Mahan, he isn't bad. In fact, here's a guy uh, don't follow the operational Mahan, all his fleet and fleet stuff, but his strategic Mahan, those six prerequisites are interesting. Mahan would look at it and go, who lives there? Nobody. So it's great you can traverse it, but it's not as if there's a lot of economic activity going there. And I'm back to these container ships. I don't know how big your railway is going to be, but they just don't take very much. And uh, it's 21,000 versus 600. It's just massively different. And if you look at the world, oh, I've got these stacks somewhere else about if you take the, all the wealth in the world, it's all basically within, I don't know, a couple hundred kilometers of the sea, basically. And if you, it, it's incredible that this transportation has been, and also I think it's the transportation and then the willingness of people to cooperate with each other instead of killing each other is another key of understanding who we can make money if we stop picking on each other and it's okay you eat with chopsticks i can deal with that i don't like chopsticks i'm doing forks who cares so there is another question in the chat uh, does the emerging new space race add some new nuances to continental maritime power uh, dichotomy a uh, categorization it does i think what's interesting to look at this is just some concepts to toss your way um, you can think of command of the commons or denial of the commons. And actually no one ever commands the oceans the way you can command territory because your ship's only at a place for a few moments and then it moves on and who knows they're coming, coming next. But that's a, an interesting thing that you can apply to commons of all varieties. So you can look at the oceans as commons, the air for flying planes as commons, space as commons, and then you can look at cyber as commons. And I know there's a counter argument for cyber. It all goes through these transoceanic cables. That's not common. Some company owns it. For the, user, for the user, it appears like a commons. And I think it's conceptually interesting thinking about them in this way. It's not all 
all the same. And um, yeah, space, I mean, I, what are we gonna do? We're gonna go claim planets, uh, who knows? But yeah, I think it's worth thinking about in terms of uh, sharing these things, ex uh, not sharing these things, but that you're in very much on exterior lines uh, when you're talking about using commons. That is a, a key discriminator. Over. So more questions? Uh, yeah, roll them. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for this talk. I was wondering if you had, what is your take on the Indo-Pacific uh, concept that everyone is talking about uh, these days and uh, the Quad, and do you, do you think it will change uh, the strategic uh, position uh, in the region, especially uh, the relationship between India and China? Uh, yes, I think another thing that's really helpful to think of is in terms of primary adversaries. That when you're looking at a country, or uh, is who's the primary adversary for whom? So, go to India. For years and years and years, it was a no-brainer. Pakistan, primary enemy of India, and vice versa. So for the United States, that was a major league headache because Pakistan and India was never a primary U.S. Um, adversary. The United States wanted to be friends with both. And of course, if you're friends with one, the other one hates you. However, once you get Bangladesh, so Pakistan is not as big a problem because India, they can't come at India from two actually very inconvenient directions since they weren't contiguous. But once that goes away and China has already done the 1962 war, which to my mind is a massive strategic blunder. They used the Cuban Missile Crisis where Russia and the United States are totally preoccupied. China comes on in and takes whatever it wants because it wants, uh, it basically wants a land route to go beat up on Tibetans and people in Xinjiang. That's what they're, it, they're if you look at the highway systems up there, that's what all that's about. And I've got maps on that, I can show you all that. Um, but they make India, which was very welcoming to the Chinese, the Chinese um, recognized Tibet as a part of China. They didn't have to do that, but they did it to be friendly. But once you do that under international law, there's no going backwards. And so then the Chinese come and invade them. So then uh, India has been having a massive rethink about who is our primary adversary, Pakistan, uh, his economy is getting relatively smaller and smaller because they're doing this continental, they should actually be trading with India. That's what they really should be doing, but that's not happening. And China is now basically invading uh, Indian positions on the border instead of talking about it. Uh, so India, which is this non-aligned country that was really sick of the West, right? It's colonized, sick of a bunch of white people essentially telling them what to do. Uh, like the Russians, because the Russians were decent to them. And uh, China is creating, uh, turning India into an ally of the United States. It's not what the United States is doing, it's what China's doing. And the Quad is really important because Japan is inherently threatened by China because China's got all these missile bases aimed at Japan. When's the last time you thought Japan was gonna invade anybody? I mean, really, why do you need lots of missiles on Japan? Where are they gonna go exactly? And then you got Australia and you got us and you got India. Uh, China wants to cause problems. That's bad news for China. Uh, and then there, those countries are very good at cooperating with each other, but then they'll do a lower level cooperation with places like Vietnam, which are just appalled by what's going on. And China's not helping itself lying about COVID. Right, Vietnam has got some new variant coming around. Everyone knows about it because they immediately told everybody, right? So that we can figure out what on earth to do. Whereas the China has been on a lockdown. They won't explain where it came from, uh, what on earth they knew about it, and they aren't talking about it now about mortality rates. I don't believe these variants are not hitting China. So China is a, is a problem of its own creation uh, the rest of us can't make them make decisions. They have to come to their own conclusions. And my suspicion of the Communist Party is they're going to double down because um, one party rule 
is explained by communist Marxist economics. It explains why the Communist Party should monopolize political power. If you don't believe that those economic theories, then what are you doing with this monopolistic party? So it, it, China, the Communist Party has these existential problems, which bungling COVID is not going to help in the remotest. So yeah, the quad is really important. And the trick is to try to get China not to fling. If you think about uh, some of the World War II generation in the States thought uh, one of our key mistakes was not building up our Navy to the Washington Treaty limits. These are a bunch of naval limitation treaties that were in the 1920s and the United States was busy doing the Roaring Twenties and then we had the Depression, et cetera. And the argument is if the United States had built a big enough Navy, it would have deterred Japan from ever getting into Manchuria because you have to cross the water to get there. And that was a huge mistake. Um, I would argue bungling the Great Depression was probably a bigger one, but the, there are lessons that have been learned. That's what the Quad is about, is about coordinating with each other so that China does not, see continental power wants to pick off people in detail one at one. Uh, it, what you need to do is deliver up packages of allies saying, no, you need to rethink this. Don't do this, it'll be bad for you. For the Chinese people, the best thing possible is just to keep trading with everybody. Open, open up, let people in, let them out chill out, hold elections, just do what normal people do. Your party will eventually win if you wait long enough. So, and over. So I think we have, we are almost out of time. We have time for one more question. Um, more a China question. What's your take on policy making relationship between the party and the PLA? Who is in driver's seat of China's newfound over assertiveness? Uh, that's an excellent question that I don't believe anyone really knows the answer, but it's interesting in China. So they, they took the commissar system, which Trotsky figured out for um, the Bolsheviks, where you have a military officer and you have a political commissar and they're paired. And the commissar is the party guy that makes sure the guy's doing the shooting does what he's told. If not, the party guy calls in the, the secret police and then you, uh, it's jail terms, dead people, dead family members, and so it goes. It's very powerful. The Chinese still use it. It's unclear with this big surveillance state. In fact, one of you was asking me a question about IT things. And this is where, can you actually read 1.3 billion uh, people's sets of data? They've got these cameras everywhere, watching everyone, doing everything, and like watching whether how many times you've jaywalked and oh, even your children in school, every time they roll their eyes at their boring teacher, that goes into your child's rating, like obnoxious kid rolled eye at boring teacher. Um, it's unclear and uh, we don't know. And I also think it's, if you look at somewhere like, um, well, you've got the next door problem, which is, you have many next door problems, but you got Syria, which has Assad, who's just wrecked his place. Or, or um, if you look at North Korea, they're starving. This is the 21st century. No one needs to starve in the 21st century. And yet these folks stay in power forever. So I don't know the answer. It's scary. They got nuclear weapons. Uh, don't count on them being illogical. Another piece of terminology that we use, it comes from one translation of Sun Tzu. It's done by the Samuel Griffith translation into English, who talks about death ground. Death ground is when you're in the situation where you're a dead person and your only chance of surviving, very unlikely though may be, is if you fight your way out of it. And you can look at someone like Vladimir Putin. Putin. There's no great retirement plan for that guy. He needs to stay in place and just kill his way out of it and to stay there. I suspect the same thing applies to Xi Jinping. Certainly applies to Assad. Where, where's that man gonna retire to? Someone will come get him. So it's a problem of these people. These, these are some of the concepts we teach at the Naval War College. In my book, Wars for Asia, in the preface, I tried to list a lot of them because they're very helpful in analyzing these problems. And yes, they're oversimplifications. But the alternative is we look at every piece of data and everything and we're overwhelmed with it. And uh, the Greeks, ancient Greeks gave us all analysis and synthesis, or analysis taking it apart, synthesis putting it back together again. So that's what some of these concepts I've tried to share with you today are about. Over. 
Thank you very much, Sally, for this really enlightening talk. I think we were all challenged and intrigued, and you gave us a lot to think about, um, especially because we are historians or political scientists who come from expertise in many different regions. And uh, thank you all for participating in the Hebrew University's Asian Studies Department Departmental Seminar Series. We hope to see you in our series in the fall semester uh, next year. Thank you, everybody. It's been a real pleasure. And before you cut me off, let me at least read the chat, <laughs> please. So, so, so. Uh, I don't think I'm doing the party line. I just gave you my ideas. Anyway, so I got, I got through the chat, but yeah, my ideas, as the big disclaimer says, they're my ideas. Yeah, sure. It's, uh, it was just one comment. <laughs> no, no, it, it's okay. L let me tell you that uh, it, it's been a real event working for the U.S. Navy. It was two jobs in one place. I learn a lot. I never anticipated learning all this stuff about navies. Although my dad had served in the Navy in World War II, but he didn't talk about it that much. And uh, I, it's, uh, I never wound up getting the plum jobs that you all have at uh, the normal university. There were two jobs in one place, a nice place to bring up kids. So we wound up working for the Navy and wound up learning way more about ships than we ever intended. So thank so, you very much. Thank you so much for coming and we'll be in touch. We'll be very happy to invite you to Jerusalem. Oh, thank you very much. It would be an honor. It's been a pleasure to meet you all. You have a great department, good questions, welcoming crowd. Thank Thanks you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.